I will try. Because there is there is a small separate extension. Okay. And and uh, and also um, um, there is this common thing for all messages when you write the system. But okay. I will ask some. I will like ask somebody to tell me how this works because when I log in to the web page of this university, okay. I don't see anything I can change. So I just see. <laughs> Uh, the course information, and I don't know if I can change the titles of the lectures, it just says lecture, lecture, lecture. So I will ask somebody that knows more. Uh, but anyway, so this is where some things will be there. And there are some things I cannot do there probably, like I have notes that I, I put there. And you can read the draft notes. Uh, these are not finished, of course, so they are, sh they are all almost finished before the lecture and they will be updated after the lecture. And when you have some comments, I think it might be possible to directly comment on the notes uh, on the drive, but you could also just send an email saying this seems wrong or I don't understand this. Uh, but everything that is there on, on the website is actually, uh, let's see, will also be available here. So this one, how many of you have used Git before? Okay. So everybody, apparently. Okay, great. So the assignments uh, will basically be done by you cloning this repository. And there will be a skeleton uh, for every one of the three projects that you work with. And then you just uh, use a fork, basically, to do your work on, the, on, your, on your new project. Okay? And then you, you basically can update uh, stuff from there. You don't have to fork everything, you only need to fork uh, from this directory here source. So everything will be there. But there is also data we, we might use. But anyway, source is the only thing that you will need to, to fork. Um, okay, so I will also put this information there. And then the last thing that we, we want to know is, well you mentioned there is some kind of system for uh, university-wide uh, but uh, I think that we will use, because I will be away some of the time, so alternate weeks I'll be the teaching assistant most of the time. Uh, there is also this QA system where me and the teaching assistant number one and the teaching assistant number two can all answer questions about assignments or everything. And specifically teaching assistant number two, she cannot be present at all because she has a full-time job suddenly. So, uh, but she can still uh, answer questions okay, uh, when he has time. So that's how we're going to work on this. Now, again, this is a new course, so the more feedback you send about it, the better it is appreciated. We tried not to do it in the traditional machine learning course style. Uh, so it might not work, but I hope it works. And it kind of depends on all of us to make it work uh, in a nice way. Okay, so that's it about the courses. Uh, Details. So if you go to this link, or if you go to this uh, course web page and go to this link, you can sign up uh, for the Q&A. And it will also allow you to enter groups. And the groups are important for the assignments in the labs, basically. Uh, that's all. Because some of you said that are not here, actually, physically, most of the time. So it's better if you kind of arrange a group there so I know who are in the group and stuff. I don't know if you can do this in the university system or not. Do you know? So it did like this. Okay, so let's go a bit. We went through k nearest neighbors, okay? It's not a very complicated uh, algorithm. And you don't have to implement yourself. There are some problems with it uh, that we can go over at some point. But first of all, let's go through the very basics of, come on, I just scroll up and down. Let's go. takes away my, okay. okay. So first of all, we want to import, so if you know Python, okay, who doesn't know Python? You all should have some knowledge of Python, okay. Uh, anybody done any serious in Python? Anything serious? No? A bit, okay. Okay, so I'm also kind of a beginner in Python, but we're not going to use anything very complicated. So, so here we import one library called Pandas, and this Pandas library is very important for machine learning applications because it has nice, lots of nice tools for loading data sets and stuff. So that's what we're going to use it for. 
and we're going to use a, a different data set than the one we explained before. It's a data set about alcohol or about wine provenance. So there are three types of wine here of different areas in the US, I think. And uh, they have some futures, kind of chemical characteristics of the wine. And there's a target, the class, which is where the wine came from. So there's a big repository of data sets called the UCI Learning uh, Repository. And this is one of the first data sets that was there and was used very, very, very much in the machine learning community for many years. Uh, but it's a very, very simple data set. So it only has a very few number of examples, a very small number of examples. And only three classes, and only a small number of futures. But it's good as an instructive uh, data set. Why? Because a lot of stuff that has to do with statistics that is not big data related, but it's usually small data related. And lots of times people draw conclusions from very small studies. And with this example, I would like to illustrate kind of uh, how strong can our conclusions be when we actually do some statistics or machine learning on a small data set, okay? You can have similar problems in big data sets, but it's easier to show them in small ones. Uh, Okay, so here this is a method basically for reading uh, comma separated values. This is a file where you basically have a text with spaces in between or commas in between, and every space is a, and every line is a row in a matrix, and the spaces denote different columns. So it's a very simple uh, format. So you can read it by yourself. It's like human readable format. So yeah, this method basically just reads that. And you get this matrix here of data. Yeah. So one column is the class and the other are the various characteristics of the wine. Now, the important thing here is that uh, when you use this idea, when you use this uh, pandas thing, then you have names for the columns, yeah? And you can load them from the CSV file with the names, and it's pretty useful. And then you can reference uh, columns in your uh, variable by the name. So that's useful. Now, there's a plotting library that we're going to use. It's matplotlib. And one thing we can do is basically look at one thing for every possible class. So here we go through all the classes in this uh, set. For every class, we're going to look at the different uh, amount of alcohol in every class. So we cannot really predict by alcohol content where the wine came from. There are three regions, but it's a pretty good guess. Okay, so the more alcohol, the more it's from the blue region, and, and the less alcohol, the more from the purple region. I don't know which regions they are. There seems to be some regional variation that is obvious. So then there's one question that you might ask, well, maybe there is one future, one thing in this data that tells you what's, where the wine came from, okay? So let's kind of think about it in, in a different way. Let's say you collect data of people that have heart disease, okay? And you see they have various characteristics and you say, well, it seems that this characteristic predicts whether they have heart disease. You, you see it a lot, yeah? Or I did the study and I found that, well, if you eat chocolate, it improves this, or if you eat chocolate, it makes you worse for that, okay? But a lot of these studies are kind of very speculative, so what they do is they have, let's say, 100 features that they record, and a few other variables that they care about, like uh, heart health or something like that, and then they say, well, I, I see it seems like uh, in this data I have, it's quite small usually, uh, I see this effect, so the more people uh, eat chocolate, the better their heart health. Okay. But it can be a very small effect, and it could be just because of the data you randomly selected somehow. Yeah. So this is one problem. Uh, so we go, go through that a little bit. Why do I have an error here? Mm, trace pack. What does it like? Name error. Let's go again. That worked, okay. Fine. Now what we have here? Uh, now we have a bunch of different uh, things that we import, okay? <coughs> These are kind of important. The first is a way to split your data in two parts. This is something to do because depending on what data you get, you might get slightly different results. And we'll show you that in a little bit. So you have a bunch of uh, examples, like 200 examples. You split the data in two parts, let's say 150 and 50. 
And you see whether you get different results depending on how you split the data. And this is an important part uh, of program methodology. So there's this method for splitting the data. And this method here basically does the key in errors neighbor classifier. And as you can see here, uh, oops. what we're going to do is we are going to go through every possible future in the data set. That's why you have this for every future here. And we're going to train an ARS neighbor classifier that just looks at this future. So if you have a new example, and this new example uh, has a higher, is closer to the alcohol content of class one than alcohol content of class two, then we're going to say class one. Then you go through every future and do that all the time. So this is a classifier that's based on one future. So it kind of tells you whether the future is predictive of the class, okay? Independently of the other futures at all. So you kind of ignore everything else. So then if you run this experiment, then you get this result, which seems to show that this is the most important uh, variable, but the other ones are kind of predictive as well. Okay. Now, if you select a different set of the data, I don't know why it tells me that. Uh, if, you, if I do it again, and I randomly select another set of the data, I get a slightly different result. Okay, so now this one seems more important than it seemed before. So now if I split the data again, and I use one part to fit this model, then I get again a different result, okay? So these results can be very sensitive to the data you get. Right? And if you have many, many futures, it's very likely that something called kind of randomly becomes very important when it's not, okay? Uh, it's just the nature of the game. So how do you guard against that? Well, the classical way to do it is you do another study, okay? But if you have a limited amount of data, what you do is split the data in two parts, and keep some of it for verification. Right. Does this, uh, uh, let's say, future still is still prominent in the rest of the data? Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the presentation here. Now. There are a bunch of things that you need to choose when you uh, do a key in this nearest neighbors uh, algorithm. The first is the choice of k. As we, we, we haven't chosen that yet, but as we said, when you have k equal one, you just look at one neighbor, and when it goes to infinity, then you basically just look at the class with the highest number of uh, infinity. And the other is choice of metric. It's kind of difficult to say what, how you choose the distance. So for example, let's say that you have these 20 futures, and some of them are between zero and one, and the others are between minus a thousand and one billion. Yeah. So then how do you do it? If, if the one feature varies a lot, then it just dominates everything if you just use, let's say, Euclidean distance, right? Yeah, because the one dimension doesn't change, the other changes a lot, yeah? So let me just draw a diagram here. So if it works. So let's say that we have two dimensions, okay? And in one dimension, we can't see this now, but uh, I should just draw it. So in one dimension, the variability is very small, and in the other one, it's very large, okay? So let's say it's like this, for example. You have two classes comes like this, okay? So, and you have only a, f a small number of samples from every class. So it's pretty easy to get uh, in a rut here and not realize that the important way in which you can differentiate the classes is kind of this dimension here because of this very large variability here. So what people usually do to avoid this problem, for example, is to rescale the data so that every dimension is the same, uh, has the same width. And you can do this in many different ways. One way is to say uh, rescaling with, uh, say, maximum span, okay? So making sure that all the variables have the same span. And the other is with, uh, with variance, okay? Variance 
normalization. That makes you mean that. So it's helping to make it so that every variable that you have has zero mean and, and uh, variance of one. That's as far as getting the data. Yeah. And this will make it easier for you to choose a, a distance uh, in your algorithm. You could just, for this algorithm, you just choose a, a Euclidean distance and not something else. Okay? So that helps a lot. And this is what we actually do uh, in this uh, setting. So if you look at the notebook, one of the things that we do is this. Uh, I have to make a shape like that. So scale, there should be something called scale in here somewhere. Scale. Yeah. So here, afterwards, one of the things that we do is we scale everything. Yeah. So this is SKL and pre-processing. Uh, make sure that the data is uh, scaled equally for all dimensions. And then, now that we have scaled the data, we're going to say we're going to use Euclidean distance. Because it seems kind of okay. And we don't know if it's the right one, but let's just say we use it. And the other thing that we do is we want now, the purpose of this now is to find the right k. So we say that there are these features, this seem important, but now let's say we want to build a general classifier that just wants to classify wines in different regions. So one of the problems of the, of the nearest neighbor classifier, or the problems of one of the parameters is this k, and the other is the distance. So let's say we fix the distance to Euclidean by making sure that everything is scaled uh, the right way, and then we have to choose the k. And there are a number of ways you could choose the k, and I'm going to go through a couple of them. But before that, let me go back here. That is a representation of uncertainty. This is another problem. Um, if you just count the number of times you get a different class in your neighbors, then it's not very representative of our certainty. If you have, let's say you have only two data points, yeah? Like here. So you have one data point here in your training data and another here. Um, okay, so you have two data points, one here and one here. Okay. And you have a new point right here. You have your neighbor classifier that will say, well, maybe if it's k equal one, k equal two, it will say, well, 50-50 is this class or that class, right? Let's say you add another point, you have only three points. That will say it's 60% uh, sure it's, it's class X, okay? But this doesn't reflect the fact that you only have these three data points, okay? So that's another problem we want to solve. We want to make sure that the uncertainty or certainty of this nearest neighbor classifier actually is reflective of the number of points we have. So if you had, instead we have these points here like this, and lots of all there, okay? So it would be a very different situation to what we have with just only a couple of points. Yeah. So you should be much more certain when you have more points than you have fewer points, okay? So how do we make sure of this? Well, there are a number of ways to do it that are specific for every algorithm, but there are kind of a few Algorithm independent ways, and we'll discuss when we discuss those a little bit. Okay. Right. Is that kind of clear? Clearish? Unclear? Okay. And then finally, uh, scaling with large amounts of data is one specific problem of nearest neighbor. How does algorithm work? It says for every point that you see, right? Look at every possible point, see which are the closest neighbors. So that means that you go through everything and you sort everything. So at, le at least linear, slightly worse than linear time in the number of points you have. So imagine you have a big data problem with billions of points. Every time you get a new point, you have to compare with a billion points. That doesn't scale. Yeah. So there are methods to do it approximately, so you find approximately closest uh, uh, neighbors. So that you can do, but then, the thing is that as, as soon as you go into big data applications, you have to go into more technical details of how you does the scale algorithmically and stuff. So we're not going to go into it, but basically, if you know KD3, who knows KD3? KD3? No, okay. Uh, so basically, what you can do is you can create a tree for all your data so that the closer the data are to, itse to each other, then the closer they are in this tree. And that means you can basically go through this tree and, and find the neighbors in a fast way. 
Uh, that's the basic idea. And there are many algorithms for doing it, and most of them are quite kind of efficient. Okay? So you can scale with large amounts of data. Uh, we might go through it uh, tomorrow, depending on time and stuff. Or we might leave it for the lab sessions. Um, okay. So what we care about the most, however, right, uh, is reproducibility. Okay? At least in this course. Can we actually reproduce a study from what we have already? Is it possible that from the data we have and from the information you have about the study, from the paper published, notes, lab notes and stuff, can you reproduce exactly what was done? Okay. Well, in this course, we'll try and focus on using two tools for doing that so you can reproduce everything exactly. So one is this Jupyter notebook. It's basically what I use now, uh, what, you sh yeah, what you saw this thing. So this is basically a Python um, shell uh, with a web browser uh, interface. And instead of having everything happening with a shell and interactively uh, creating windows, it creates everything in a kind of notebook style. Yeah. Has anybody used this before? Okay. Yeah. So this is what we're going to use most of the time. Uh, in, some, in some ways, it's clumsier than doing it uh, with, with proper code but uh, it's easier to make documentation with it. Okay. And then, of course, there's VN Git or Mercurial for keeping track of what you did. Specifically, let's say you write a study, okay, you have done your notebook, and then you have a specific version of the study that you submit for a review in some journal or published somewhere. And then you say, well, this was the version I used, and then save it, and then everybody knows exactly what you did. So it should be possible to just reproduce exactly what you have done up to hardware uh, changes or software uh, operating system changes. Now, the other thing that is more important beyond computer science is scientific reproducibility. Uh, somebody has done a study, they have a conclusion, the salmon can see people happy or not. Well, can we reproduce this? It's not uh, uh, trivial. Uh, if you have a new set of data, maybe you use exactly the same methods, maybe you get a different result. So that means that the data was somehow skewed or uh, something like that. The other thing is that if you are publishing results about a new method, so you invent a new algorithm, let's say k nearest whatever, you say this is better than k nearest neighbor for doing this type of job, then you have to be able to prove it somehow. Yeah? And you need to have this computational reproducibility. So somebody wants to check your algorithm, well, they can just use your implementation. They can do it from scratch, of course. Uh, but they can try and use your algorithm in other domains and see if it's actually a good algorithm. So if you're more a computer science or statistics person, you're working with methodology, you'd, you'd have, it's really essential for you to try and, and publish code uh, so people can reuse your methods. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times in AI research, these are not really done very much. So uh, we have a lot of results that are kind of frivolous. Okay. Uh, for example, there is this trend of publishing, let's say, better and better performance in some specific data sets. Say, so, well, it's better now but than it was before. But even though you don't really, s when you apply your algorithm to these data sets, you don't really see the, the test data that you're uh, working with, you're still somehow learning from it. So, you, uh, so a lot of times you have an algorithm, you apply it to some data set, then you slightly different data set, you apply the same algorithm, not changing anything, it doesn't work at all unless you spend a lot of time making it work. So. When you say I have a method that works, it, it means that it works a lot of times after you have spent a lot of time making it, uh, everything, tuning everything. It's different from saying I have a robust method that can do this. Yeah, it's a different thing. And what you, w you want, like, the same way that in science you want the robust conclusions, this you would like an AI method to be kind of robust uh, as well. You apply this to something else, you don't have to do a lot, just plug and play. Okay. So how do you say your methods are good? Well, there is a way to test it very simple. Just see what happens when you try and predict something and uh, you do your prediction and you see what happens in real life, right? So this was the 2016 election in the United States. A lot of people were spending lots of money to predict the results, right? Very few got it right. They got it right in some details, right? They got right the fact that um, Clinton would get a couple of percentage points above uh, Trump. Okay, that was, seems okay. But I didn't really predict the, uh, the, uh, the result in the number of electoral votes, which is the uh, 
a second tire of uh, what happens is the if you don't know in the electoral system uh, people vote in every state and then in every state it has representatives and then the number of representatives in every state uh, can be from one candidate over the other it's a winner take all most of the time so it's kind of non-linear so it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen and there are a few difficulties with this specifically with elections one thing is that we have a lot of machine learning, a lot of assumptions, is, uh, standard assumptions is, in statistics. You want to try something and see how well it works. Well, you have some independent sample that is unbiased and you measure that there. And this is, is not the case here because the way that the sample possible voters is not the way, same way that possible voters go and, and vote. So the sample by telephone, for example, or the sample by web form, it's not the same as the distribution of people that the sample is not the same as the distribution of people that go and vote. So there's a kind of distributional mismatch there. Uh, and the other assumption that you made, what other assumption is there that people make when using this course? What can you think? Uh, so this one you can fix by weighting the populations and stuff. Uh, but there are some other assumptions that you always make. Yeah? That people are true to what they say. Well, people are true to what they say, yes. Very good. Another assumption. Yes? Okay. Um, I guess you can answer that you don't know. Yeah. And that the distribution or that it has equal. So you know. Yeah, actually, I don't know then. Yeah, the distribution can remove it. Yeah, so it's not probably there. Yeah, you have to have a way of assigning it. Mm. Yeah. And of course, there's one website that tries to, tries to, to correct this type of issue. The probability of winning the election given the results now. It's different from uh, what is the probability of somebody winning if they get vote exactly now. So these are kind of different problems, right? Everything, so there's a change with time, there are people that don't answer or, or answer untruthfully, uh, and there's people that uh, are going to not going to vote and they answer, and the other way around, people that are not going to answer because they are not told that they're going to vote. We have this kind of uh, problem. And this is a very simple thing because it's a yes no, it's a, it's a, it's a binary answer, right? The models are very simple. Uh, they have to be kind of simple, but still, uh, you have lots of data, lots of money spent, but still you cannot predict the result, okay? And here, another important thing is that you care about who's win gonna win the election. It's a different thing from predicting the percentage of votes a, a person gets. Yeah, so that's what you care about more. No, you don't really care about the percentage exactly, okay? So, Anyway, so the main focus of this kind of hands-on is independent evaluation. So I have my model, let's say, for voting prediction. Well, the independent evaluation, simply there's the election, I can see how my model behaved with the real data, okay? Um, I will have my k-nearest neighbor classifier. Well, I try it on this data. Then if I try it on completely new data, it, it, should, uh, it should give me more or less the same result, okay? Yeah. But the basic idea is if I use some data to create a model, let's say my key nearest neighbor classifier, because I use it specifically for this model, there's no way I can use it for this data. There's no way I can just use the same data to evaluate it, yeah? So if we take the example of, uh, if we take the example of K nearest neighbor, right? You have these X points and you have these O points here. And if this is your training set, and you say, now I'm going to, evaluate my k-nearest neighbor algorithm on this training set with k equal one you will always get nearly perfect performance yeah because this is the data you have it's like memorizing the data you have a table of the data for every possible combination of features you have one class you have a new combination of features from the existing ones well you can see the class directly right so it's like looking up the table and uh, you don't get exactly perfect performance though sometimes can somebody guess why? So you have all the data on, on your rows. Okay, so you have, let's say, data one, class one, data two, class two, data three, class three, and so on. Yeah. But, so now you want to predict, if you see data one, you say, well, it's class one, so it's correct, because you have it already stored. So there's the probability, of course, that if data three is equal to data one, yeah, and you have to evaluate this, then you will not get a perfect performance because for the same input data or for the same features, you have a different class. 
So even with nearest neighbor, k equal one, it's possible you don't get perfect performance in the training set. But this is a kind of a very special case. So yeah, so that's why we don't evaluate the training set. It gives us this false confidence that the algorithm is performing well. In general, if you have a theory, there's the idea of falsifying the theory. Because it will be a test saying, yeah, it's wrong, or it's not, it's not right. OK. So uh, let's go through this a little bit. So how can you actually uh, talk about this uh, process where we we'll verify things and stuff? Hmm. Let's see. Uh, let's start with data collection. Right. So you are polling agency and you want to collect data. You have to decide how you want to collect the data. Yeah. Let's call this she. Okay. Uh, I don't know how you practice this in the region. Um, so she is, let's say, I will do it by telephone call, I will do it by randomly clicking in the street, or by using web force. So you use some way of collecting data. Okay. So you collect some data, let's call this the training data. And you have some, you choose some algorithm, key nearest neighbor, or I don't know, uh, uh, just averaging everything, let's say you're calling. Just average everything, no way it's not applied. Now you have your classifier or, or uh, predictor or something uh, of voting uh, performance. So you have something as an output, okay? So your algorithm gives you an output. In this case, your KNS algorithm will give you a classifier that classifies different classes for different inputs. This might depend on how you value the data, okay? It might not. So here, in this diagram, the squares are variables you control. So you control what's the data collection, you control how what the algorithm does. The, the circles are random variables uh, or dependent variables in general. So depending on how you collect the data, you get different training set, but it could be a randomly, uh, if you do it again, you get a different training set. So it's random in that sense. And the classifier again could be a random outcome that depends on both the training set and the algorithm. Or it could be the mistake. So this one, these kinds of diagrams, I will formalize them more later. But for now, I just this high level idea is that the uh, arrows represent dependencies. So if you think of this as a function, this is a function that depends, that has only one input, it's how you collect the data. And the classifier is another function uh, whose input is what was the algorithm and what was the training data. Okay. So the result of the classifier is just this. Okay, is this guy okay for you? Uh, and the blue line represents a statistical dependency in the sense that uh, there's some real process going on, and the red lines in this particular diagram are computational. Okay. You can do some random stuff if you like computationally, but it's not computational. So what we'd like to do is be able to have a way of measuring the performance of our algorithm. So the typical way to do it is to create a holdout set by using again another data collection uh, the same data collection procedure to collect data. Now we have a measurement, okay? So instead of measuring the, the classifier that you get in the training data, we measure it in this other data set. So now it's interesting if you look at the links, there is no direct link, right? So the, so the data it creates the classifier and there's another data creating the measurement. So there's no direct link between those two. So you don't, you, have a, you don't have any direct link between the training data and the measurement. The only link is through this classifier. Uh, so that means that your evaluation is independent of the training data. Uh, so this, in, this, this idea of independent evaluation makes sure that your results are unbiased. And the fact that these two things both come from the same data collection process ensures that we have the same distribution. Typically, you use this model for another reason, but uh, I think it was also issue to illustrate how you do things. Okay. So, how what you want to measure? Typically, what you want to measure is uh, some utility function in expectation. So, the utility here will be basically how often you classify something correctly. So, let's say your classifier gives some specific probability of a decision, specific class. So, the action of the classifier is Taking a, selecting a specific class Y for any possible data X. 
So if you have the complete data distribution, then typically what you would do is uh, write up the expectation of the utility, the number of times you classify correctly, over the other distribution. Okay? So there's a probability of observing the data x, y under the data collection distribution he. Okay? Yeah, this is just a definition of expectation for discrete variables. So, but we don't have this distribution, we just have some data collected from it. So what you typically do is you replace this with an empirical estimate. Okay, so he, by the way, here I usually put as a subscript, uh, either the distribution or the data that approximates the distribution. Uh, so basically this is just the data collected in the holdout set divided by the number of uh, points in the data set. That's your average performance in the set. So when the data size goes to infinity, this becomes the same as, as the original expectation. And we also know from uh, uh, concentration bounds that, in fact, with a finite number of samples, you are always getting, uh, your, your error is exponentially small. Uh, your error is only uh, kind of polynomially small uh, when you estimate this expectation. Okay. It kind of depends exactly on the assumption of the distribution, but in general it's kind of uh, 1 over square root n, where n is the number of data. So you can get pretty good classification accuracy. The only real problem is not whether or not your expectation is well good enough for the real one. The only real problem is whether or not this is measured in an unbiased way. And we can ensure this by making sure that the training data is separate from the holdout data when we uh, do the measurement. So now think about the human as an algorithm. So you want to choose the best possible classifier or the best possible parameter for your classifier. You have your training data and your holdout data. You choose one algorithm, lambda one, or a parameter for a specific algorithm. Gives you a classifier, and you measure this classifier. Now you have another algorithm, algorithm two. You get another classifier from it and you measure it again. So now you have unbiased measurements for both of them, okay? And you use the same data to train both of them, that's fine. And you use the same data to test both of them, that's also fine. You don't have to use the same data, you could use independent data to, to test them if you wanted. But this makes the variance of the test uh, difference smaller. So, so it's better to do like that. But this is the classical way to select hyper probabilities for an algorithm. But this actually creates another problem. If you do this, let's say, a million times, then is the performance that you measure here the actual expected performance of the algorithm? Or not? No, right? So you're kind of trying to maximize something that is different from uh, uh, the actual expectation. So you have this expectation curve, let's go here. We're almost done. Come on, I'm very slow. Okay, uh, I will probably go through this a bit later. But uh, can I very slow or not? Am I okay? What do you think? I'll have another session tomorrow, so we can continue. Uh, but let's continue with hands-on or not. Ah, let's go a bit here. So. So why you can think of this as a maximization process, right? So you, you want to find the optimal lambda parameter or the optimal algorithm, yeah? And you measure this performance on some specific holdout set, yeah? But then there's the actual performance, the real performance that you don't see, uh, which could go like this, for example, okay? So then you're maximizing for this curve, but the real curve you should be maximizing for is here. Okay. So what you should really do is use another data set again to really uh, get some estimate of the performance you will have if you choose this parameter. So this is what we're going to go through in the in the holdout, in the hands-on thing. Okay. So let's just go through that a little bit. So this, this is the thing we're going to implement now. Okay, but now we'll do this by uh, by algorithm, sort of by hand. 
So we have this standard scaler. Am I doing more anything here? Hello. Okay. Okay. So if I split the data in some way, uh, why does it die? Sometimes it does this. I don't know. Why. Holding the data, putting the futures. Now have a different case, okay? So split the data into parts. Have number of test data and number of training data. Fine. So here we measure. So here we have put the test the data in three parts. Uh, the training data and the test data. This is where we actually do the measurement. Okay. And we see that when we change the parameter for k for the algorithm that the uh, performance seems to drop all the time for the training set which is kind of what we expect because for the training set when k equals one we get the best possible performance yeah. but for the test set it seems to be slightly different okay so it all depends on how you do the test sets because if you choose it differently then you get a different result let me do it again do the training data again So here it's different again. So every time you, you have a different training test split, you of course get different results, right? So it's a lot of things about life. And you see that the care for the test set is much more rough because the test set has only very few examples compared to the training set. So you cannot have very fine-grained performance measurement. Okay, but let's imagine for the moment that the test set is what we have to test against. So it's like somebody keeps it in the bank and we never see it, okay? And we only have this training set to play with. We cannot just use a training set to choose a value. So what we do is we use holdout sets. Yeah. So there's a particular way you can use holdout sets, which doesn't s depend on choosing a specific one, because we might be unlucky and choose a stupid one. So the idea is called cross-validation. And in this, we randomly split the training set in two parts. One is the training, uh, it's a sub-training data, and one is the sub-holdout data. And we do this many times, let's say 10 times. And then we train on one and test on the other. And then we see the performance in this very small test set. Yeah. And that's the idea of cross validation. So there's a very simple way to do it in Python. Uh, there's uh, actually a method for it directly. And then what you get is that for every possible uh, way that you split the data into training and holdout, you get a different performance curve with k. Okay, And then you can try and plot the average and the standard error between them. So you get this variation. So it seems like there's a peak somewhere here in terms of the core validation, and it drops uh, as time goes by, as k increases. But it seems that around here is the sweet spot. Okay. Okay. So now if we plot all together uh, the training error, this one. Here you see that the highest number is there, k equal one, perfect performance. And then the cross validation error, which is uh, performance, it seems to go higher and higher as you observe. And you can use that fact to actually select the best k. And then you can see, okay, what's the value here for the test set is that one. So you can say that this is the, the right one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. Wait, are we almost done? I think we're almost done. But I would probably rather explain this a bit more uh, in detail tomorrow rather than go through it fast now. Uh, but anyway, the only I would just want to close by saying that because the test set is very small, we don't really know if it's the performance of the measure is the right one or not. So we'd like to have some estimate of how accurate we are. Um, and we can do that actually. So thank you. And tomorrow there is in another room we have meeting, and I think they have computers there, right? I think so. I hope they have. You can have. Uh, you can also do some stuff on computer. Okay. Right. 
And don't forget to sign up for this piazza thing. Thank you.